Hello, Purple Cult. I'm your host, Anastasia Elliott, and welcome to another episode of The Purple Sessions. I am an independent singer, songwriter, producer, visual creator, and wellness junkie. This show is all about creativity, self-expression, and mental health. I am so excited for today's guest. I'm gonna be interviewing Reed Shippen, who is a mixer, producer, engineer, entrepreneur, and 10-time Grammy winner based here in Nashville, Tennessee. Reed is one of my all-time favorite humans on this planet. He is such a kind-hearted, talented person. Like, amazing. I had the pleasure of recording my upcoming debut album with him. Even if you aren't in music and have no interest in the process of making a record, Reed's wisdom far extends into other areas of life, including mental health and entrepreneurship, and I promise you have many gems of wisdom to gain from him. Today's conversation was a bit longer, but that's just because he's so awesome and there's so much to learn from somebody like that. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this conversation. There are going to be weekly videos with so many cool people. Anastasia Elliott and welcome to another episode of The Purple Sessions where I talk to experts from all fields about creativity and trauma and mental health and all of the wonderful things surrounding it. Today I have the most amazing guest and one of my favorite people on this planet, <laughs> Reed Shippen, who is an incredible mixer. 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 That's so... Mixer. Mixer. You're a mixer. Producer. <laughs> Yeah. Mixing. Mixing engineer, producer, engineer, investor in many cool businesses, and just like a super amazing human. We've been friends for a long time now. We have. We have. And you know, I'm honored that it, since you couldn't find any experts, you would have me on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's always great to see you. Of course. All right. So you got questions? I have some questions. I got answers. I've got some questions and some tangents that will go on. Great. I love this. My first question. Well, actually, the first thing I want you to do is just to tell everyone a little bit about yourself in your own words. Oh, you gonna so, do this to me? So the non-music people understand what you do and why it's important in music. Okay. Um, I hate bios. I hate bios. You do. If you look me up online, so my bio actually bio. says I hate bios. <laughs> So it's, I find it really hard to talk about myself. Um, so I don't know where to begin. Um, I'm a I'm a um, kid from New Jersey who fell into a music business career after trying a couple of other things out and worked my way up from intern to assistant to recording engineer to uh, what people tell me is one of the top people doing this um, possibly on the planet, I'm not sure. Um, I've had a lot of great luck and worked on a lot of great projects and, and had a lot of great experiences. I've done lots of number one things and lots of gold statue things and, and all of that stuff. That doesn't actually really matter. What matters is, is um, doing a good job and uh, you know working with people like you who have a voice and have a vision and helping make that the, the best version of that vision that we possibly can and you know and just trying to get one percent better every day so i spent a lot of time in a recording studio making a lot of records i discovered um that those skills actually translated to a lot of different areas so i have expanded into a lot of different areas doing biz dev and startup consulting doing investing in food and beverage and in um uh, startup companies and in real estate and um, you know, I, I, uh, I created direct for a sync company out of New York and I, I, there's probably 20 things on my resume that I don't even remember cause I don't really care. I just, I just want to, I want to work with great people. Um, I want to, I want to do great work. I want to uh, make a dent in the universe. I want to raise great kids. And, um, I mean, that's, and he says he's not an expert in anything. That's why I'm here. I'm not an expert in anything. <laughs> Jack of all trades is master of Jack none. Jack of all right? trades. <laughs> Well, I think we can be alike in that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Do you still keep your Grammys on the back of the toilet? I do. I do keep my Grammy. They're a toilet paper. <laughs> they're, a, they're a paper towel holder on the back of the toilet. 
Um, uh, we're running out of room in the bathroom, so, you know. Where do they go next? I, I think they're going to stay in the bathroom. My, <laughs> More shelves? Yeah, my wife thinks that that's, <laughs> that's kind of a slam, but I think it's no. just kind of funny, you it's know? Great. I mean, it's just... It's... I think it perfectly is, like, the essence of you. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, uh, Grammys are, Grammys are nice, right? That was very gratifying, and, and, uh... And it, honestly, it hurt a little bit because my parents thought that they kept telling me that music was a hobby and not a job until like the second Grammy showed up. And then my dad was like, so not a lot of people really get know. these, right? You know, and, and but I keep them in the bathroom because I'm not really interested in the Grammys. I'm interested in like what I'm doing today it's and such how a we can make that great. Of measurement now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly thankful that, like, those are, those are the affirmation that, um, your peers think that, uh, you've made a, a significant contribution to, to, you know, those areas of music. So I'm incredibly grateful. Of all of your Grammys, which is the favorite project you've worked on? You know, I can't say that. It's, it's, everyone's different, right? And, and, uh, I mean, there are, there are projects that are difficult. And there are projects that are that almost seem like a vacation, um, but uh, the what I always like to say is, this isn't really about me, right? So, so when you come to me with a project, you have poured your heart and your soul, and who knows, ten years worth of writing and all of this effort into it. My job is to help you make that as great as it possibly can be. It has nothing really to do with me. I'm just there to to try and and facilitate that and to also give you an outside opinion because you've had your head in it for so long just be like hey you're not looking at this like hey wake up like, and that let's was look like at this. one of the main reasons why i wanted you to be one of my first guests on this because you're almost like a like a tool or like a catalyst for bringing artists visions to life mm. in the best way like especially for a project like mine where you saw it through engineering and mixing and production like it was so much fun. It was everything, but it was, you know, saying, Reed, I want this to sound like this, like, random thing, or, like, make this kind of sound. Cool, let's and do it. It was cool, let's do it, and let's pull out these, like, awesome, like, vintage mics, and, like, this is how we're going to get this sound, and, like, if we, like, reverse this, this is going to get your effect, and I just went through watching hours and hours and hours of studio footage from us in the studio, and it was so crazy to watch the whole process, literally the entire thing. I watched the Wild. whole recording of the album and like all of the random things we did. To, I, there was actually an amp that caught on fire. I totally forgot about that yes. moment. Yeah, and it was like going to be like off. the perfect amp for that song. And <laughs> <laughs> you were like, you saw it and you're like, of course. And yeah. it was at Blackbird because yep. some of my favorite footage is you getting angry at 1979. And the mic is starting to fall while I'm recording, and you, I'm like, Reed, it's falling, and you came in, and you're like adjusting it, and you're like, not fucking surprised. And like, yeah. yeah, but that stuff turned out great. Oh, like, it's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And you can feel the difference in the, in the That's studios. funny. But, yeah, but you, I mean, even in just the mixing process, like, you're taking all of the elements that we've painted and like placing them on the canvas and like where you hear them and like there's so much as a listener when you don't understand those elements that you don't even know they're happening but this like tiny little ear candy thing that's like right here in the left bottom corner is like something that's what creates feeling in the track i just i thought it was great it was collaborative i love i love working with artists like you who really really want things to be great and have a vision for it that's so much better like the worst the worst thing to do, I think, in the studio and in life is to work with someone who's like, I don't know what I want, but I know what I don't want. That's the worst thing. You always knew what you wanted. And that's why we ended up like taking, like getting a truck and taking a piano mm -hmm. from like my studio to another <laughs> studio so we could record it, which, um, you know, was just fantastic. So yeah, I, I, I had a blast working on, working on your record. Let's do more. We will. Oh, I can't wait to play you the new stuff we've been writing. Can't wait to hear great. it. I can't wait for everyone to hear the stuff that we made, though. And this is the year for it. This after is it. Yep. This is a it. A decade now that's been waiting in the Three hundred one pandemic, 300 years later. Here we go. Mm-hmm. Um, 
what is I mean you're in the studio with a lot of different artists like what is a really common like creative pitfall that you see artists go through I mean the biggest creative pitfall for artists is self-doubt right it's imposter syndrome right and uh, the the thing that I that I've realized after working with a ton of people is literally everybody has it. So the the thing that we can best do is just embrace the fact that everyone has imposter syndrome. Everyone thinks deep down someone's going to point at them and be like, you have no idea what you're doing, right? Um, you just have to just accept that and move through it, right? This um, is so true. Yeah, and, that's, and that's, that's the thing that trips up almost everybody, right? Everyone doubts. I have worked with people who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars and they're still like, is this okay? Like, am I doing, you know, are people going to think this is cool? Is this okay? So I just tell everybody, like, be you. How do you deal with your own imposter syndrome? <sighs> Alcohol. Um, <laughs> you just push through it, right? Like, it, it's, it's, it's a constant process of affirmation and also... Uh, just, just work. I mean, you doubt yourself, you push through it, you just keep pushing until you get something great. I was working on something today where actually when I left to come here, I, I knew this isn't at the level where I want it. I'm not liking it. And I actually, instead of sitting here and fighting with it, I need to just walk away from it and walk back tomorrow with a new perspective and just approach it from a different way. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because the, the only thing you can do is give your best. Yeah. Right. Like, be your best. I would much rather fail giving my best than trying to guess what somebody else wanted and failing on those terms and then be like, oh, wait, 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 that's not really what I thought, you know. So at some point I just say, fuck it, let's... If you're you know. really not feeling a song or if you don't, if you just straight up don't like the song or hate the direction that someone's taking it, how do you push through and show up as your best when you're like oh, I'm really not vibing with this. Because, I mean, I know at this point you can be more selective about your work, but I know there's still projects I'm sure that you take there's that always, you are not in love with. No, no, you can't. If you only worked on the stuff that you truly loved, you wouldn't work much, yeah. right? So... How do you stay creative in that? Well, so my perspective is this. Like, somebody poured their heart and soul into this. This is about somebody's mom or somebody's experience or they spent three years working on it or it's really, really important to them. So my job is to try and make what they're trying to say as good as possible. Me judging them doesn't do anybody any good, right? Like, I just want to make it as good as possible. I want to make them as happy as possible as I can with it. Um, it's easier when you totally vibe with it, right? But... Um, it's, it's just a different challenge. Like it's, this is skill. Like this is craft. Like it's almost like putting a puzzle together. Yeah, it is. And, and we're pros, right? You know what pros do? Pros work, mm -hmm. right? Amateurs wait for inspiration. Mm -hmm. Pros do the work. Yeah. So this is my job and I do it. There was a show that we, the show that we headlined a couple weeks ago that I was so excited for. We had like, it was supposed to be the show that we played the night that, COVID lockdowns happened and so we were playing this show like two years later and I was so excited for the show for a long time and it was at a venue I was so excited to play at and I got on stage and my pedal board wasn't working, my ears went out halfway through the show and it was a show that I knew was going to be like, I wanted it to be like one of the funnest shows I've ever played and it was hands down the most stressful show I've ever played but I got through the show and I had to keep being like, focus on your performance. Like, it's fine. Nobody knew. The audience loved it. It was like, they went as yep. crazy for it as other shows. Yep. But afterwards, everyone was like, you know, how did you feel? Was it like amazing? And I was like, tonight I was being a professional. I did not enjoy most of that show because I was constantly trying to figure out how am I going to do this? How am I going to play this? Actually, funny enough, I had a dream the night before that I forgot all my piano chords. <laughs> and it felt so real. For the first time ever, I actually made little cheat cards with the chord progressions and taped them to my piano because I was like, it just felt too real. And if I hadn't done that, I would have been in trouble because all I could hear for half the show was this, yeah. not even my vocals. And so mm. I was flying completely blind, playing piano, and I had to read it because I was like thinking about too many things. So glad I did that. 
I'm gonna gonna try to wean off of them now because now I'm like, oh my god, they saved my life. What if it works? It worked. But that was that was the equivalent of that for me. I was I was a professional that night, and it, it my worst nightmare happened, and I still pulled through, and yeah. it was and it then was you great. Know, and now and you it was empower. still great. Yeah, I mean the the amateurs worry about them having fun. Professionals worry about the audience having fun. Um, I I uh, I worked with this guy named Kenny Chesney, and and um, my he used to live down the street. Did you really? Yeah, there's a house we call the Kenny The house on the house. hill. Um, uh, he, uh, we went and saw him in Seattle. My, my, uh, my wife's sister is a huge fan, so we just said, hey, come meet us in Seattle. You know, we'll have dinner or whatever. We were out there. She lives out there. And then we took her backstage to the Chesney show. And, uh, and he played, you know, he plays like a three-hour show. Yeah, it's long. And then he comes back in, and, you know, it's just like, hey, how you doing? He's like, hey, check this out. And he pulls up his pant leg, and his leg is duct taped, like from his hip down to his shin. And I was like, dude, what are you, what the hell happened? He's like, oh, like two nights ago I fell off stage and like I busted my leg. But, you know, I mean, I can't not do the show. I had no idea. He couldn't even bend his knee, and he played a three-hour show. That's a pro, mm -hmm. right? So we're here to be pros. You know, that's the... I mean, this is the gig, right? Yeah. Like, do the work. Yep. Do the work. It is nice when it's good, though. It's it nice is, when it's everything fantastic. works. Yeah, I mean... Out of every ten projects you get, how many of them are you, like, stoked about? You know, I mean, the worst day doing music is probably better than the best day, like, in a coal mine. So yeah, there's true. there's that whole thing. There's always something it great. It still is hard. It, it is. Still it's hard. hard. It's fine. And that's okay. Life is hard. But, um, you know, there's... Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm rereading Viktor Frankl's um, Man's Search for Meaning, and he has a he has an equation in there that said uh, that said um, basically despair is suffering without purpose because mm -hmm. all life is suffering like we're mm -hmm. all going to suffer, but if you suffer without purpose, you go into despair, right? So you might be working on something that you don't particularly like, but you go and find the good in it, and you find it through the artist's vision, or you find it through something fun, or you find it through like something that you could do that's creative that might set something off, and that's where you find your purpose in it. So there's that. there's no bad days, really, honestly. You know, the hardest thing is is feeling not not personalizing the rejection when you work really hard on something yeah. and someone's like, I don't like that. Oh man, do I know about that? I, everybody, does. <laughs> like, all yeah. artists do, all it's, creatives it's do. It's tough because it's it is every I think art so is in our like inner child that every time you share something like that it feels like when you're a little kid and you're like look at this drawing I made and like if you have to really like take care of that part of yourself because the rejection is tough. I take it personally. I take it personally every, all the time. I, if you say you don't take it personally you're a liar. Or you're just honest. not. Or you're not good at your job. Yeah. Right. I am good at my job so I take it personally because yeah. I take Passionate everything personally. Everything. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um but you have to train yourself. It took me a long time to realize when I did something right and someone praised me to just say thank you instead of saying, oh, no, 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 you know, I'm not that good, like whatever. But it also took me a long time to realize that people came to me because I was good at my job. So when I would send something out and they would come back with, here's what's wrong with it, they were assuming all the right stuff because that's why they called me in the first place. I was assuming I didn't do anything right. Right? Mm -hmm. So it would like wound me when they were like, well, here's what's wrong with that. It took me a long time to realize there's 3,000 things right with it. Here's the five things that I don't like. Right. Don't focus on that. Focus on the whole thing. Assume positive intent. That's a, that's a great, I was about to say, that's a great metaphor Assume for life. Assume positive intent. Right? Yeah. And, that's, uh, and that's, that's a hard lesson to learn, but... Um, you know, that's how you get past imposter syndrome. Well, it's also tough working on art, because I think a lot of people, you know, they don't really think about all the hands that a song travels through before it gets to your ears. And when there are so many creatives a part of something, like there's a piece of everybody in it, and it's hard when, like, somebody kind of is like, no, no, don't like that piece that you put in this. <laughs> yeah. When the, you asked about the projects that I like the most, the projects that I like the most are the people who are there to make sure that it's great. Mm -hmm. 
and when you're working on a project where everyone, it's not about ego, it's not about I'm right, you're wrong, it's not about trying to prove anything, it's like how can we make this the best thing ever? Those are always the best projects, even if they're difficult. Those are always the best projects. Absolutely. Right. I feel that way about every aspect of creating. I don't, I don't really enjoy creating like completely alone. I love the collaborative experience yeah. of knowing my strengths and weaknesses and everyone else's strengths and weaknesses and knowing how we can put all of our strengths together to make something that's like super insanely magical. Almost all the great creative output has been through collaboration. I mean, music is shot through with amazing collaborations, whether it's stuff that you see, like the Beatles, or it's stuff that you don't see, which is Stevie Wonder making like amazing records, and then Robert Margoleff and all of the guys that were like helping in in the background and all of that making it happen. Like, yeah, and it's it's uh, that's why this this job is so great is because we get to collaborate so much. Yeah, it's like play dates. It is. <laughs> So at one point in time, I held the record for mix notes with you at seventy hours. Has anyone talked to me? No. <laughs> seventy hours? You yeah. counted? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but obviously, I blocked that out. No, no, it wasn't just notes. I wanted to sit with you for it all, and you like everyone was like, "No, you're not going to get to do that." But I think I learned the most about sound from sitting and watching you mix and you showed me like every tiny thing that you were doing to everything and now people just probably despise working with me. <laughs> That's hysterical. So, you know what's funny is like I have no memory of that being an onerous process and I think that's probably oh, no, because it, we're trying to, <laughs> yeah, no, it's just we're trying to make something great. Yeah, you let me, you let me do the little automation stuff, you pulled up the vocals and you're like, okay, you're going to do your own vocal automation and you were like one of my greatest teachers about sound <laughs> and like knowing when things were too too busy or like I'm a maximalist like obviously look at my art like I want everything to be as much as possible and I learned so much about like when things are too much or like how to carve out places for sound and like it's totally shaped me as like how I think of now as a producer. And Perfection is not achieved when you can no longer add anything it is achieved when you can no longer remove anything. Mm -hmm. Some smart person said that. I don't know who it was. We'll see. I'm glad nobody's talked to me. <laughs> yeah. No. If it was actually 70 hours, yeah, you totally win. <laughs> Hysterical. Okay. What is one thing that you wish you had known before going into this line of work and any advice that you would give young audio engineers that look up to you? Um... I wish I had known how much of a ego bruising journey it could be and not to take it personally. Like, don't take things personally. I feel like it's been the theme of my this life. This is the, right? you know, I mean, I, I mean, I, I tell people who are starting this, I tell them to read a bunch of books and one of them is The Four, Ingre Four Agreements. Oh my gosh, that book is incredible. Right, it's if, incredible. If you haven't read that book, like, that is Yeah, it's definitely read The Four Agreements. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful encapsulation of a lot of things that are basic, basically human, but one of the four agreements is don't take it personally, right? Um, that's really, really hard when you care. Mm -hmm. So I would say care and then work hard not to take it personally, you know? It, you may not be successful because that's part of what caring is. But, um, you know, I, I mean, stand, st stick up for yourself. Believe in yourself. Um, do your best work. Uh, and, and try not to get offended, you know. Because at the end of the day, especially for people like us, it's not my record. I say this all the time. You have to listen to this record for 10 years. Um, I have to listen to it for 10 days. You need to be happy. It's your record, right? Like, I'm there to just make sure that it's happy and also to make sure that you don't screw it up. Yes, so true. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I, well, I can say that we made something that I am still so happy to listen to. Oh, man, to I still videos. play it for people and they freak out because yeah. it, it sounds like, it sounds creatively, songwriting-wise, performance-wise, just uh, sonically, it sounds like nothing else. And that is why we get into doing this. Yeah, it is. 
It is about to let my 10 year old release baby it. out release into it. the world that I've Stop been Stop talking about it. Like, and I have a release date. It's happening. Good. It's happening. Do you spend a lot of time searching for new music outside of work? Or do you get your fill of it during the day? And if you do, what do you like to listen to most for This fun? is horribly embarrassing. Like, I used to be the guy... Um, when I started, I would go to Tower Records and buy stacks of CDs. I spent so much money. If I had taken all the money that I spent on CDs and put it into, like, Apple stock we'd be having this conversation on my yacht, right? In the Maldives. Like, I, it would have been a ridiculous amount of money, but that's what I was passionate about. So I was the guy who knew stuff bef six months before it came out, who had the remixes from Europe, who had all of this stuff. Now, I don't listen to anything. I, I work so much. I'm listening to what I'm working on when I leave. Your ears get tired. Oh, man. I just, I don't. I don't have the bandwidth and it's embarrassing. Like I feel, I feel there's a sense of disconnect because there's so much great stuff out there. But after I'm working for eight hours, like concentrating, I don't, I don't, I don't have the bandwidth. It's not that I don't want to, cause I totally want to. I just can't, I can't accept it. I can't listen to it as something that is revelatory or relaxing, right? So most of the new music discovery that I get right now is is stuff that like my kids mm -hmm. turn on to me because they're listening to a huge wide range of music. But yeah, unfortunately, I, I uh, it's a real struggle to to hyper focus for so long and then yeah. you know go home. I listen to NPR. I'm actually really new to listening to music because for a really long time I chose not to, and I honestly never even thought thought about it like it just wasn't something that was part of my life and as a writer I didn't like when things would accidentally influence me I like I liked to be in my little bubble I listened to classical music and things that I like wanted to be inspired by and just didn't really listen to music and then now dating a music journalist who listens to music 24 7 I'm listening to music now and there's a lot of really cool stuff out there if it was up to me to find it would never listen to it but I can't listen to music as much as he does because it's always going on in here and I'm always listening to it for work and let my ears, like I hit a point. Sure. At that point. I think it's a good frame of reference, especially if you're a creative. I mean, one of my favorite places in the world is the Metropolitan Museum of Art and you can walk through that. Mm -hmm. You can walk through that place for days and you don't have to take this drawing style or this painting style or this shading or this sculpture or whatever, but it's going to influence it's just going to expand your vocabulary. I did that for years and years and years and years. Um, you know, and unfortunately I find myself in a season right now where I don't do that, I don't think, enough. Uh, but uh, I think that's just a function of where I am right now. I, I hope to break out of that and find, find like a different way of doing it, but... We got to record in a very old school way that not a lot of people I think are getting to record now. I mean, obviously the projects with like mega budgets are, but even some of those I think are going towards home home studios. Are you seeing more projects come to you that were made at home or like produ producers own studios or are you still seeing a lot of records get made kind of the old fashioned way like we did where we kind of got in there with a bunch of amazing musicians and like had a plan, but like it was made all at once there. Like it there. depends. It depends on the style. Like, um, I was just talking to a friend of mine who does a lot of work in LA with guys like Max Martin and Ryan Tedder. And, um, you know, a lot of what they're doing is, is, uh, really focusing on making the right great, you know, like the track and the right. And, um, they'll spend 10 or 20 sessions mm -hmm. tweaking melody. Wow. Right. Like they're really focusing on that. Are they spending a ton of time in a studio recording musicians? No, because a lot of it's programming mm -hmm. or a lot of it's one guy with a guitar doing stuff. Switch to the other side of things. Like, you know, we just spent a week in a really great studio with unbelievable musicians all playing together to create um, a record. So it, it really has to do with what kind of music you're creating and what the, the artist wants to do. But the beautiful thing about it is it's, it's really easy to be creative anywhere now. Like, mm -hmm. like, there's 
all kinds of opportunity for creativity. I mean, this room, you can make an entire record in this room, mm -hmm. which is super awesome. That's the plan. Yeah. This is a this is actually perfectly proportioned for a studio. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm like, so, you're, you're yeah, I'm looking at this and I'm like, you know, you there's it. like four or five things we could do in here and it'd be totally perfect. I'm um, I'm excited about it though because I got that rare experience of getting to like do it yeah. right and like have the budget and do it the old school way and now album two is gonna be like a whole different experience and I think it's going to be a lot closer to home. And I'm just excited to see how that's different. Hundred percent. Whatever works. Like if it sounds good, it is good. If it sounds good, it is good. Yep. So true. I've been amazed though with what you can do at home. Like, damn. Well, there's been a there has been a technological revolution, right? And uh, you have to, you have to flex with it, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, this this room. You could absolutely turn this into a world class studio. It's gonna be great. I actually, when I built this room out, because it was just framing, they were supposed to soundproof the ceiling in that room in particular, and they was gonna have a soundproof door, and it was gonna be like a vocal booth. And then they just didn't. They forgot to do the Oops. soundproofing. So now there's no door because that's got my piano and all this stuff in there. But that's all right. I can send you a. I can send you a an, an old guy who's done this a million times and he'll totally hook you up. When it's when it's time for record two, this this is gonna be it. I'm gonna build this out. You should start record two tomorrow. I, I'm writing for it. I started writing for it actually a couple weeks ago after taking honestly a few years off of writing because I've had this project now waiting for so long and I was still writing for a while but it kind of got to the point where I felt like I was just writing for my hard drives and that was not, not like a fulfilling. fulfilling or happy thing to do. It was kind of depressing in some ways and so I shifted my focus to like finishing all the content for record one and going towards the visual side of things and now I edit video and I've like learned all these other skill sets that are now informing my writing for record two because now I'm like, all right, now that I have a release date for number one and this is happening, it's time to start record two. I have the whole concept. Like once I've decided it's time, concept came in, visuals came in, I know exactly what this record's gonna be. And it's exciting and very different. Killer. Different process. But even just like learning how to be a video editor and do all these other things, it's informing how I write. Absolutely. Now for well, and that's the the people who are gonna who are gonna win going forward are the people who can do all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, and like that's... my ten years of waiting in the wings and gaining all the experience. Sure. Yep. <laughs> yep. And and then now the challenge for you will be, uh, how to decide when, this is what, you can do anything, but the question is is what should you do and what you should you get help with. Right, um, because you know you can spend, you can spend twenty years making a movie, but that may not be the best way to do it. You know, so you're gonna have to find that balance. Yeah, we're getting faster this time. <laughs> a little bit faster. But right? you know, would have been out two years ago if not for pandemic. It's okay, slow this all down. That's right. But for the best, excuses, you know, way excuses. better place in my life to release this now. I would love to see ago. Anastasia release one new song a month. That's the plan. Yeah. That's what we're doing. That's a good plan. Maybe that's every six weeks. Six weeks, six probably. Weeks. It is yeah. six weeks. That's what, that's what the algorithm likes, apparently. Apparently. Every six weeks. Yep. And uh, lots of videos of Derek sighing. Right. With tracks under the Sigh guy. Sigh guy. Sigh. All right. Science fiction. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Tell me one of your favorite studio memories that's maybe one you've never shared before. Oh. You put me on the spot with this stuff. This is not the way my memory works. Well, I mean, I mentioned well, one earlier. Well, I watched earlier. every interview that you've done. Oh, and I was that's like, too bad. No, it was great. And I was like, I'm not going to ask you any of the questions that people usually ask gotcha, you. Gotcha, right. Because they can already find that information. Well, I already <laughs> mentioned one of them, honestly, was that like we, when we were working on your record, we played a bunch of different pianos, and I had this kind of like funky old upright, which was not in... 
like perfect condition, but it definitely had a vibe. And you were like, this is the one, we gotta take it. So <laughs> we had somebody come and pick it up from my house and take it to the studio so we could record it. And it was perfect, right? It, it was, was like vibe. great. It was the vibe. It was the vibe. Right? Do you so, remember which track it's on? I don't remember which track it's on. I'll have to find it in the video. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't remember. But I mean, part of the reason why I don't remember um, isn't has has nothing to do with the music. It has to do with the fact that I probably listened to ten thousand oh, yeah. songs. Between, <laughs> between I was gonna be shocked to be remembered, but it may have been. Nah, I was gonna say it may have been cigarettes of gasoline. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember. It was perfect though. <laughs> I, I mean, the the I do tell the story where the guitar amp blew up in Blackbird and set mm -hmm. the fire alarms off. <laughs> Um, and that was, uh, full disclosure, that was a friend of mine's amp, and it was like a vintage mint, vintage amp, and we blew the transformer up, so I had to put a, a new transformer in it, thereby, like, devaluing the, you know, the oh, amplifier, no. but that's alright, he's cool, it was in, you know, it was in service to tone, so we were good. I hope that answers your question. Yes, that's great. Great. Mm -hmm. What was your first impression of me and the music project? <laughs> um, what was my first impression of you? Probably obsessive weirdo. Um, uh, I mean, polymath, right? Like, I was really impressed with the with the depth and breadth of the musical expression, like you brought in all that classical stuff and everything. And then I figured you were going to be a pain in the ass because, you know. That was one like, question on here. How difficult on a scale of one to ten was I to work with? You're a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. But it was worth it, right? Like, you know, pain in the ass with bad music is a nightmare. Pain in the ass with good music is totally tolerable. Like, I don't, you know, that's okay. The strength for greatness. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 uh, this is why we, I mean, this is why I do this, because I want to do something awesome, right? So the, the, I, the worst insult that I feel is when someone's like, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Like, I fucking I hate, hate the that. word yeah, fine. Exactly. I hate the word fine. <laughs> so, you know, fine I, mean, is there, bad. I, I is guarantee you there were times when we were doing this where I was just like, oh, would oh, you sure. please? I and saw it in a video. <laughs> really, like, Jesus Christ, like, you know, whatever. Um, and, but that's okay, you know? I mean... It turned out great. I'm entirely proud to play anything that we did for anyone at any time. <laughs> so I'm good. Like my memory is short and I have blocked out all of the <laughs> horrible stuff. So and we're still friends. So <laughs> worked out. If you could change or reform one thing in the music industry, what would it be? Transparency. Um, there are a, an awful lot of creators who are making really great music and there is this opaque wall between what they're doing and what's going on behind the scenes. Um, what's really fascinating is technology is running so quickly now. There are such amazing stuff uh, that is going to basically force the transparency to happen. I want to see creators have their music, their art, anywhere, everywhere, at all times, and anyone can use it, and no one has to ask permission, and it doesn't take six weeks to figure this out with the management and the publishing company and these permissions and that. It just gets used, and the money flows right back to the creator. This tech, the technology exists. The thing that is stopping it is the traditional music industry, right? Um, there is no transparency. Yeah. So that's the thing that I want to see. Um, I, a good friend of mine says uh, he has a he has a mantra, and he says um, data should never get in the way of creator attribution or payment. Right, and that's really what everyone's working on is like to make sure that you know everywhere on the planet where someone's using your music and it's totally cool and they don't have to ask; they just do it, and the money comes right back to you. It's going to be revolutionary, and a lot of people who make a shit ton of money. From doing it the old way where nobody knows what's going on have a lot to lose so mm -hmm. that's gonna be the battle but inevitably we're gonna be in a place where we're in an interesting shift right now. it's a hugely interesting shift and when you look at it from the bottom up if it starts with the creators here's the thing the the thing that everybody knows especially all the people in the music business is there is no music business without the music mm -hmm. right so the creators are the most important thing 
because if Beyonce never writes or sings another song, no one's going to make a dime off Beyonce, right? So she has the power, not a label or a manager or a PRO or a publisher or whatever, right? That got forgotten maybe a little bit. I think people need to be wise. Every creator would have to care and get get together on it, though. Because yeah. if a small group of creators does, like, I think it's like, fuck them. Well, so here's what's interesting. So how do you, yeah, how do you get around that? Well, first of all, do you know what the largest outlet of music on the planet is? No. It's YouTube. Oh. By far. Like, by far. It's not Spotify. It's not Apple. Um, it's not Google. It's not, I mean, it is Google. It's not uh, Amazon. It's not, like, anything like that. It's, it's YouTube. Um, the majority of the music that is listened to on the planet is outside of the label system, mm -hmm. right? Um, because there's, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. So if you take all of the creators that aren't signed to a major label and you aggregate them, mm -hmm. they are collectively much larger than the people who are. Absolutely. So you're going to start to see a paradigm shift from that side of things. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a benefit for creators. I mean, the music business has remonetized all the labels you know, were scared that they were going to crash and burn. They're making more money now than they ever have. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good sign for creators, right? Because there's demand for content. Yeah, definitely. So, so. I think the one thing that I would want to see change is the vanity metrics being everything, the most important thing, and how, from major downward, how easy it is for people to just, like, fake that the vanity metrics are... Humans are vanity are metrics, right? But when the vanity metrics keep a lot of indie artists from certain opportunities and stuff, but you can be up against somebody else who's purchased all of the, the vanity metrics. I think the if there was stricter things to get rid of the vanity metrics. I think the second that vanity metrics went public, like Spotify, and it became a competition, I think it, in kind of the nasty way where you could just kind of purchase your way there. I think that hurt creators a lot. Everything human is a vanity metric. I mean, the the actual truth is that we're all still in high school, right? Like it's 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 all it's a popularity contest. It's a popularity contest, right? Um, that I think that's good news and bad news for creators. There's more there's over a thousand digital service providers. There's more opportunity to get your music out to everyone. Uh, there's also a lot more shitty music. Um, and the bottom line is, great songs will Rise show up. Top. They just will, because people resonate with them, right? So you can buy as many likes as you want for Friday, Friday, gotta get down on Friday, and it will peak for a moment, and then it will be gone, right? Um, and the careers. Yeah, there's... Uh, Great stuff sticks around, and that's, it's, it's starting to become more of a meritocracy, which is really scary for artists, because maybe your stuff sucks, right? It's scary for people like me, where the old school paradigm was there were all these separate jobs, and now the person who kicks ass in music is the person who writes it, mm -hmm. programs it, arranges it, plays all the mm -hmm. instruments, engineers it, mixes it, masters it, like sings it like the whole nine yards they do everything now even the like programs now that are like you know you're mastering things online sure. that people you know yeah 100 percent. like if it sounds good it is good right some people can do it all some people can't that's totally fine um you know but this is just the reality so i i mean i think it's really exciting i mean it's scary and exciting usually the best things all the cutting edge <laughs> shit is scary and exciting yes <laughs> scary and exciting <laughs> My motto for life, I think. Yeah, that could be like, that could be the name for the next the record. Answer, scary and exciting. Scary and exciting. <laughs> um, before I get to like the couple of questions that some engineers sent me for you. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about mental health, and I know that like you talk a lot about you know how you kind of have a uniform, so it's one less decision that you have to make in a day. What are some of your like tricks for your mental health, keeping your mental health great so your creativity can flow? 
I, I mean, the first is the admission that I'm very bad at it. Like, I, 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 I know what I should be doing, and half the time I do it, and half the time I don't. Um, part of my mental health journey is not recriminating myself mm -hmm. when I don't do it well. Um, because you get lost in beating yourself up for that, which doesn't help you do it better the next five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, being aware of that is key. Um, being aware that I'm going to always fuck up and that's fine. And, and the point isn't not screwing up. The point is what you do next, mm -hmm. right, is key. Um, I, I think the more, the farther I go, the more I learn that, that focusing on the things that are important is really, really important. Like that's key. So what you try and do or what I've been trying to do is like the outfit, like is I systemize the stuff that's not important so that I can spend more time on what's important. Um, you know, uh, my wife and I have arguments about like, she, she's like, why do you have to schedule stuff? And it's like, well, it's important to me that we spend time together. So I schedule that because it's important, mm -hmm. right? Like don't assume that if it's important, it'll just happen. If it's important, you make it happen, right? Intentionality is a huge part of being happy, being healthy, being productive, like just saying if I'm gonna, I need, I need friends, mm -hmm. right? I need good friends. So I'm going to seek out people that I love and respect and I'm going to intentionally be open and intimate with them and I'm going to foster that connection because it just doesn't happen naturally. We all think, oh, it's just gonna happen naturally. No, mm -hmm. it's rare for something to happen naturally. Like, you know, you have to make it happen. So. Yeah, I mean, I wear the same, I basically wear the same outfit every day because I don't need to spend a single minute of my time thinking about what am I going to wear? I'm wearing that. Let's think about something that's important, right? Um, I'm trying really hard to systemize that. I have friends who are really good at it and I'm jealous of them. It's difficult for me because I'm a little ADD and um, a little overwhelmed sometimes, but I'm just 1% better. Kaizen, right? Like just try and get 1% better every day. So... If you improve what you're doing by 1%, which basically means like today, if you're not feeling particularly fit, just get down and do one push up, right? And then the next day, do another push up. If you get 1% better, I'm probably gonna misquote the statistic, but if you try and get 1% better at something every day, at the end of a year, you'll be 34 times better at it, mm -hmm. right? And it's really easy to just do one push-up today and then do another push-up, you know, two push-ups tomorrow and then three. So, I mean, that's, that's the way it works, right? That's, that's just how it happens. I'm really working hard to work on the systemization of things and getting my time management to be better because I, I wear a million freaking hats in a day. Yeah. And it's freeing. I mean, you know, a year ago, a lot of my life blew up and I kind of went from super overachiever like over living to compensate for everything that was out of my control to like Two. swinging the complete opposite direction and being you know more reckless more like I don't care about my diet and I'm not gonna exercise because I don't feel like it and like just swung the other way so this whole past year six months has been like finding my middle again and I'm super into this like one percent that I think I'm reading one of my best friends is obsessed with time management and like watches videos on time management and people like how they do their planners and she gave me the atomic habit and has been talking to me atomic a lot about are amazing. the one percent better and just like the tiny tweaks that I mean there was the some team that was going for the tour de France and they like did like tiny things like just adjusting you know their seat position or like you know what they ate before or like all these things and they hadn't like never won and then they like sure you know all these tiny things that you know didn't mean practicing harder or you know working themselves to the bone it was just these like tiny adjustments that like made all the difference and we've been working hard to like systemize things now so to where i'm not just working from 8 a.m. to midnight every day completely inefficient because my artist brain will be like that a lot yeah well, there's a couple of things. You can fall prey to perfection. No one's yeah. perfect, right? No one's perfect. So you need to build in 20% of a mess, which means if you're working a 10-hour day, two of those hours are going to be wasted, right? Mm -hmm. And instead of getting pissed off at those two hours, you're just going to recognize this just happens and I'm going to adapt to that. 
Um, also, you also have to realize that, I forget what the name of the, the theory is, but if you give yourself 20 minutes to do something, you'll do it in 20 minutes. If you give yourself three hours to do it, you'll do it in mm -hmm. three hours. So it's really important to just focus on what your purpose is. Find out what things are the most important to accomplish that purpose. Put milestones in. Make to-do lists. And then when you feel tired or you feel insecure or you feel scattered or you don't know what to do, you don't have to think mm -hmm. through any of this. All you have to do is do the next best, the next thing on your list. Mm -hmm. Do that thing. After that, do that thing. Trust the system. Trust the process. You'll make tons of progress. Yeah. So a little bit of work in the front end, lining it up, a lot of forgiveness for when you don't get it done. Uh, one of my good friends who's incredibly productive, he's like, I do this thing every day. He gets up in the morning, he journals, he meditates, he does all that stuff, he prays. Um, and then he's like, I do MITs, most important things. There are three things. If I get one of those done, it's great. Mm -hmm. If I get two of them done, it's fucking awesome. And if I get three of them done, it's a banner day, right? But at least you know at the beginning of your day, these are the three most important things. And then you eat the frog. The hardest thing, do that first. Mm -hmm. Like knock it out. Um, yeah. The sense of accomplishment that you get from doing that is incredible. Yeah. I definitely noticed in myself, like, the busier I get, I have to schedule a lot more time for mental health. Like, I average about four hours a day on just taking care of myself, which may sound excessive to a lot of people, but my body is my instrument. My body is, like, everything. So if I'm not sleeping enough or meditating and keeping my mind right, I won't ride as well. And if I don't do not only my cardio, but my stretching, my foam rolling, like the things that keep my body fit and in alignment, I won't be able to play my show to the fullest. I won't be able to run around on stage for an hour while doing insane vocal acrobatics and mm -hmm. journaling. Like that just helps me to dump everything out of my brain that like, it's you know, all connected. Me. It does. And, and a lot of people that I'll be like, wow, that's insane. Like, that's a lot of time. I'm like, I will be so much more productive and show up so much harder at my work if I make that time. And I think a lot of people don't choose to make that time yeah. now. So It's incredibly frustrating that that's the way it works, but that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. the, the most successful investor on the planet, or one of them, a guy named Warren Buffett, like somebody asked him about his day. Figuring this guy, I mean, this guy's a hundred billionaire, whatever, super mm -hmm. hyper productive. And he was like, Well, I spend four to five hours a day reading. And this person was like, How do you have the time to do that? And he was like, How would you learn anything? Mm -hmm. Right? How do you not have the time to do that? Same thing. If you don't take care yeah. of yourself, why are you even doing this? Exactly. Right? You know, so I, I mean, I, I, I and, and, Full disclosure, the first thing I do is throw my own needs and my own health out the window. Same. Like the first thing Absolutely. I do. In fact, I'll even get mad at myself and punish myself mm -hmm. by not doing the things that are healthy for me. Um, that's, that's bad thinking. Uh, you know, you're going to be a better person for you and your life and the people around you and the people that you love if you work on making sure that you're clear and your body feels healthy and you know, I mean, your body's gonna talk to you and the things that are going on are gonna come out. Like dealing with all of that, it's, it's I wish I had, I wish I had been taught this, you know, when I was 19. One of, this is the main reason I therapy. wanted to start this, to show the people's, you know, experience with taking care of themselves and mental health because I started to notice as I was giving speeches at schools, a lot of students would message me and be like, wow, you have it so together, like, you've been through all this stuff, and it, like, like, how do you keep hope, and, like, or I, you know, I post a lot of inspirational stuff on social media, and people would answer and be like, you know, I don't understand how you're so positive all the time, or, like, how do you, like, you know, stay faithful about things, and I was like, clearly I'm doing a disservice if people think that, because I was, you know, this was when I was going through a really tough time in my life, and I was, like, having crying meltdowns almost every single day and reading these things and I'm like I'm doing what I hate about other artists and other people on social media who are just showing the good stuff and not the bad and I think this is my way of doing it without you know 
I'm not going to be the person crying on social media and like oversharing, but I think it's super important to help give information about mental health and creativity and like how you can heal yourself through creativity and how there are so many tools out there to heal, your, heal yourself. Like I've done it myself, like from plane crash to losing my voice to chronic health issues, abuse stuff, like you name it, deals lost, like so many times that I've just been like pushed to the bottom and have to resurrect myself. Like I've done every kind of therapy on the planet from hypnosis to talk therapy to crystal work. I'm a Reiki instructor. Like I know all kinds of stuff, but a lot of people will make those excuses of like, you know, it's expensive. Therapy is expensive and eating healthy is expensive. And I'm like, no, it doesn't have to be. Like, there are so many resources out there. There are so many people that you can listen to and follow that give great tips. A potato is healthy. That doesn't have to be expensive. You can sure. make a nice salad for yourself or a potato. You can make delicious meals that are not expensive. And you can find free meditation apps. Like, my favorite one is free. There's Insight Timer, 80,000 free meditations. Freaking love it. Moving your body doesn't cost money. It doesn't have to. Like, I just... I'm really passionate about sharing if everyone, this information. If I, I, totally, I totally agree with you. If everyone on the planet got up, spent 10 minutes saying prayers or meditating or just deep breathing and feeling what their body had, spent five minutes doing, and I think this is very important, uh, affirmations, mm -hmm. where affirmations. you know you say, um, I'm a person that surrounds themselves with good people. I care about the the you know the way people move through the world i am a helper i'm a you know i'm a supporter i i have great friends i i have great talent i work hard like all of those things it sounds stupid to say them out loud but the way humans work if you keep saying them to yourself over and over again like you start to inhabit them go for a 30 minute walk right drink a big glass of water i mean that can make such a huge difference um just don't look at your, don't get up and look at your phone. Mm -hmm. And it's the small things, the small promises you can keep to yourself. Like, I'm definitely the type that's like, okay, I'm going to start tomorrow and I'm going to do 20 incredible things. And you set yourself up for failure. Yep. So Perfectionism this time failure. around, I'm like, you know, that one small promise I can keep for myself. And if I've done that for a few weeks, I can add in something else. For affirmations, I actually started doing this a really amazing practice or an affirmations where you do the stream of conscious journaling three pages every morning for like a week and then you go back through and find all of the negative statements that you wrote about yourself like you find your critic statements and then you write all of those down and then you turn those into affirmations so if you're saying things like you know I suck at writing lyrics I you know I'm a shitty writer I you know didn't show up today in this way then I would turn it around and be like you know I have a lot to say and I can use my voice to say it. And so you're working with like the things that for you are the, the critics sure. in your head that Absolutely. are taking you down every day. Absolutely. I'm going to get some nerdy questions Yeah, nerd for you. questions. Let's do it. A few rapid fire nerd questions. When mixing tracks, which may not have been optimally recorded, how do you manage artists' expectations of a finished product? Do you evaluate the multi-tracks and then have that conversation with the artist prior to mixing, or do you go ahead and mix it and let the chips fall where they may? No, I just go for it. Like, I can't control what I get given. Um, there are... I just do the best I can, the most I can, right? There are certain things that give you a glass ceiling and you're not going to go beyond that, and it's actually a challenge because I've worked on stuff where I'm like, I want this to be here and it's never getting there, and it's not my fault, right? Because I always think it's my fault. Like, I'm not doing this right. Um, but no, there are glass ceilings. And, and I, I mean, I've had people say, I want you to make my vocal sound like John Mayer. And it's like, no, because you're not John Mayer. And the only person, the only reason why it sounds like John Mayer, it has nothing to do with the microphone or the preamp or the mm -hmm. technique or whatever. It's because it's John fucking Mayer, right? Like, the guy's a great singer. So... That's just what you deal with. So you learn to manage expectations and then to try and read between the lines when people are saying one thing, what they're trying to express is, is something else. Mm -hmm. Some people are delusional and that's fine. Um, you know, there's nothing you can do with that. But 
generally you just do the best you can, the most you can, and, and try and find creative ways to, you know, they say you can't polish a turd, but you can't paint silver, right? So, you know, you just find creative ways to make things work. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> That's funny. That's amazing. Yes. Okay, when mixing, how or by what means do you go about injecting energy into a mix? Do you have any primary processes you follow to do this, or do you find this to be a result of the presented arrangement, or both? Um, I hack into arrangements when need be. Um, I listen through the song first and identify things that jump out to me, and then I try and accentuate those. I'm constantly taking bits and pieces and flying them around. Like, I'll hear a really cool hook, and it's like, that's going in the intro. Um, I spend a lot of time paying attention to carving things out of certain sections so when they hit like like the chorus section like it really jumps um, a lot of people spend a lot of time worrying about how things fade and how things trail and if we're going from an intro and we're hitting the verse most of the time I'm taking all of that and just deleting it mm -hmm. like so it scene changes like that instead of just kind of fading out like nobody gives a shit um, you know almost all of our favorite records they the, the more surprises that you get, the more people engage with it. So I spend a lot of time trying to clear stuff out and then trying to make sure when scene changes happen, they happen in a way that's just like a little bit like, ooh, shocking, like fun. I think that the way you mix is like a second round of production. Sometimes it is, I guess. It yeah. Is. It is. Okay. All right, it appears you may have refitted your mix room for Atmos. What led you to make this decision and how was the conversion process? Oh my God, process? who are you talking of? Who are you talking People to? People that love you. Ah, uh, wow. Well, are that's... you getting requests for Atmos work? Are you still incorporating your console? And how has this affected your work? The console's gone. Completely? Gone. Wow. Yeah. Why? Um, it's... Do you miss it? Uh, you know, so for the past couple of years, the the... Um, the way I was working was only using a couple of little pieces of the console. I grabbed that and moved it off to a rack mm -hmm. over here so I can still access it when I need it, but I don't need this massive thing sitting in front of me. Um, so I, I love change and I love challenge, so that was a change in challenge. And it was also, you know, it's kind of a, it was kind of a talisman, like, you know, this is something that makes me feel secure. It's been around for a long time, so it's really healthy to strip that out and have to mm -hmm. be, have to do a different approach. Um, but I still have the, the parts of the console that I use generally with the SSL, it was stuff for drums mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I still use that um, when, it, when it works. I actually, today I was literally working on a song. I was like, maybe I should run it through that. I ran it through it. It wasn't as good. I took it back off. So whatever works. Um, yes, I have a full, I have a full, Dolby certified reference level Atmos room now. Um, mixing and immersive, you're gonna love immersive mixing. I can't wait. Because it's, it's literally like, I think probably the way you hear music, it's the way I've always mm -hmm. heard music. I've always been trying to make it feel like it's all around you, now you can actually oh, do yeah. it. Oh yeah, I mean, that's one of the main things I learned watching you mix, I, when I'd be like, this here feels empty, like I don't, like this, this area feels empty, or like this, this area needs something, like right here, or like right, right. here, like. Well, now we don't have to. Now we don't have to compromise and make Rob Peter to pay Paul to jam it through two speakers. You can actually just place it in the room. So it's, it's fascinating. It's so much fun to uh, to mix in. It's a whole bunch of new challenges. Yeah, I've done a hundred more than a hundred Atmos mixes. Um, I'm still learning. Uh, it's it's a fascinating challenge, so that's where I'm at that's right really now. Cool. Yeah, it's super cool. All right, this is my last question for you. Okay. The best advice anyone's ever given you. Oh man. It doesn't have to do with music or anything. Just the <sighs> advice that really made a difference to your life. <laughs> I don't know how I can distill it down. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. A friend of mine told me this recently uh, about assuming positive intent, right? Because when someone criticizes or someone says something that you can interpret as, are they throwing shade at me or do they not like me or, um, you know, is that mean or whatever? Um, you can turn it into a lot of negativity. Um, my buddy C-Mac, said that he learned this at Apple, like working at Apple, and they said, always assume positive intent. 
So when somebody says, you know, I don't like the way the drums sound, it's not, you're doing a bad job. Mm -hmm. It's, my vision for the song isn't compatible with where this is happening. Let's change it so that it is, right? That's a much more positive thing than, I suck, I did the drums wrong, they're not gonna like me, they're never gonna hire me again, my career is over, like all of that, like, spiral. Mm -hmm. This so, is actually a thing in um, a lot of circles of like talk therapy of learning how to read subtext, like what you're hearing is not actually what people are saying because from behind what they're actually, words they're speaking, there's their own life projections and all of the things and you know experiences and traumas and everything that they're bringing with them up until that point and everybody's just operating from the place that they know best and when you can learn how to look at a person for like all that they are and what they may be putting into that, you can learn how to listen differently. 100%. I have an internal monologue that mm -hmm. I assume everyone hears, and I am shocked when people don't understand me because I assume that they're hearing the conversation I'm having in my head. It was revelatory for me when I was in therapy for actually this happened to be my therapist, but he's like, you do realize that I can be angry at you and still love you. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that because the way I read it was if you're angry at me, then... I'm not worthy of love, like mm -hmm. you don't love me, knowing that, and again, assume positive intent. I'm pissed at you, I think that sucks, I'm, that makes me really angry. That doesn't mean I don't like you any less. Like that means you're my friend and I love you, but I'm still angry and that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Assume positive intent for yourself as well as other people. Um, I think that's, I mean, that's, that's probably the most, that's probably the most important thing. I don't know. I, I could probably dig up a couple more things. It's a good one. Yeah. Um, read a lot of books. Go read the Stoics. Read yeah. Viktor Frankl. Yes. You know, like all of that stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to stick with that for right now. Positive intent. Assume positive intent. API. Thanks for being here with us. If you made it all the way to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. This is awesome.